Thank you, Caroline. Um, and thank you for involving me in this um, in this adventure, in this uh, uh, two days uh, symposium. Um, it's a very rich uh, set of two days and um, I'm delighted to be the chair of uh, this final double session, which has a focus on the lenses of the researcher. Uh, so welcome to you all. Um, and um, I think we'll return now to or return our focus again, uh, probably to uh, the researcher and the lenses um, that are at her or his uh, disposal to study the discursive practice of architecture. And in fact, I think we have two sessions, um, two final sessions with papers ahead of us, which have a slightly different focus. Uh, the first one, um, I think discusses strategies or theoretical lenses for selecting, framing, interpreting research material or architectural production in a broader sense. And then the second uh, subsection or subsession zooms more in, zooms rather in on what exactly we can consider research material or archival material or the material of study uh, for this, um, for studying this architectural practice. So um, let me check if everybody is here for the first session. The Gitte, um, let's see, um, Sophia, I hope she's there as well. I cannot see her yet, I think, but yes, welcome. And uh, Joseph um, Bedford, yes, welcome. <laughs> um, so I'll take the example of Helen and, um, I'll first introduce the three of you and then I'll give you the, the floor to present uh, your paper. So our first speaker today will be Birgitte Louise Hansen and she will be talking uh, about, or the title of her talk is Notes on Interpretation, Analyzing Architecture from the Perspective of a Re Reflective Practition Practitioner. And um, Dr. Architect Begitte Louisa Hansen um, has her own office in uh, Rotterdam. She's a Danish architect. She's an independent researcher, teacher in architecture analysis, in architecture analysis and architectural research, a writer and a curator of exhibitions. Uh, she was the editor of the publications, uh, publication Beyond Clinical Buildings has written for different publications and magazines and spoken at different conferences and symposia. In 2018, she defended her PhD, Architectural Thinking and Practice at Delft University of Technology. I think she will also be talking about that. Our second speaker is Sofia Psara. Um, her, the title of her presentation is The Building, is building Within the City seeking a congruence between the autonomy of architecture and the evolutionary form of the city. And Professor Sofia Psara is author of The Venice Variations, Exploring Cities and Buildings as Multi-Authored Processes of Formation, alongside authored projects of individual design intention. Her book, Architecture and Narrative, explores the relationships between design conceptualization narrative and human cognition. Her edited book, The Production Sites of Architecture, addresses the production of knowledge in architecture. Sophia is the director of uh, history and theory PhD program at the Bartlett School of Architecture and has taught undergraduate graduate studios and seminars at the Bartlett, uh, at the University of Michigan, Cardiff University and the University of Greenwich. Our third speaker today, um, Joseph Bedford, will talk about the architectural discourse in a post-literate age. He is an assistant professor of history and theory at Virginia Tech. He holds a PhD from Princeton University, degrees from Cambridge University and Cooper Union, and was the recipient of the 2008-2009 Rome Scholarship at the British School in Rome. He is the founder of the Architecture Exchange, which is a platform for a theoretical exchange in architecture. And is the, he is the founding editor of Attention, the audio journal for architecture. So welcome to all of you. And um, I'd like to give the floor now to our first speaker, uh, Birgitte. Uh, 
Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Ah, okay. Good. Loud and clear. You can you can put your PowerPoint on uh, Begitta. Yes, I will. You like uh, share screen. Is do you see it? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Well, it's been amazing two days. Uh, so my head is kind of full from the last session on the tools of the researcher. And I'm specifically also interested in all this idea of making drawings. I'm afraid my presentation will not be as generous in terms of uh, visuals, but uh, we'll have to do with what I've got. Um, I'll just start. Uh, as uh, Freddy Frole, Fro, Flore said, uh, I'm speaking on behalf of my own studio as an independent researcher. And the content of the paper is based on my dissertation at the TU Delft in the Netherlands, in which I explored how the practice of architecture can be understood, analyzed and discussed as a field of thought. With the title of the dissertation, Architectural Thinking and Practice, I wanted to communicate that I study the thoughts that underlie decisions and practice. I thereby break with a convention that architecture primarily is about buildings. My work as a researcher is related to the discussion of reflective practice, thinking about thinking. As a result, I've been looking at how thoughts are constructed in relation to a number of factors, of which some are internal and tied to the individual thinking, others related to external stimuli contextual conditions and the collective. This meant that I started questioning the definition of the design paradigm, ways to understand design, designing and the role of designers in the development of projects, which led to handling three different analytical traditions and ways to understand designing as respectively the production of objects of art, the things designers make being a materialization of a relationship, a negotiation, a real life situation, in which architects participate a process and designing being a product of a social cultural exchange and or a historical document, an artifact. I call this the three premises for my research. Besides being a practice led research, the PhD was situated within the field of hospital architecture. For several reasons, it was guided by four objectives one of which was to develop and test tools of analysis. In the framework of this conference, the practice of architectural research, and this session, the lenses of the researcher, I will concentrate on this methodological and theoretical side of my work, the development of the system of inquiry and the classification system of five interpretive lenses. This slide is an overview of pages from the PhD showing the classification system of the five lenses. On this slide, you see how a visual catalog is, a, is accompanying the verbal argument in the paper. Besides showing an overview of how the analytical classification system of the five interpretive lenses relate to the realm of practice, I in the paper also give an example of the definition of one lens and an example of its application in research. I will get into this in a moment. The idea of combining verbal and visual data in the construction of an analytical argument was also fundamental to my dissertation. It was a carrier of meaning, exemplifying how the thought field of architects can be made manifest through drawings, texts, models, images, buildings, etc. This slide gives an impression of the appendixes which were added to the main document. Described in the paper, a timeline, Appendix A, and a comparative analysis, Appendix B, were formative for the way in which I understand and analyze architecture as a system of five different knowledge fields. The timeline was primarily about mapping the historical situation within which hospitals emerge in the municipal of Copenhagen in a time period of 100 years. The information was sought in overview literature and structured into five main categories and sub-timelines. Methodologically speaking, the timeline was an analytical tool to map the most important moments in time. Not only what happened, but the reason why. It also made it possible to compare information on the sub-timelines to see 
whether there were interrelations between the historical data, like one situation leading to another. As public intellectuals and agents for people within society, architects were one important group of citizens in the development of the municipal hospitals. Question was, what role the architects had and could have next to very well informed and influential people, such as the municipal client, state officials, and potential users like managers, doctors, and nurses. While studying the historical narratives, I therefore started to collect material about the development of the three largest municipal hospitals. This led to another document, Appendix B, in which the data was analyzed, discussed, and compared. While ordering, analyzing, and comparing the data in Appendix B, certain notions started to appear, and specific ideas became central to my perception and reading of the material. This enabled me to structure the source material thematically into conceptual categories, which I could write about and group visually. Inevitably, this was a repeated process in which tests were made to see whether it was reasonable to proceed the way I did. The interaction with students in architecture analysis played an important part in this work. The classroom was, so to speak, my analytical laboratory. The research into the world of practice was as such paralleled by an independent methodological research about classification. The argument in the paper is divided into a number of themes. While the prologue states how I'm not only interested in the objects that architects make, I'm interested in the designer, the design and the decision-making process as a way of acting in the world, actively participating and critically. The analytical foundation explains how the design paradigm implicitly is questioned in the research, meaning ways to understand design, designing and the role of designers in the development of projects. This meant, as described in the analytical strategy, that the research is based on fundamental questions such as how to describe what architects do, how they think. Besides, what is architecture? And how is this made manifest through the architectural means by which an architect work, works? The analytical strategy developed through, developed through an open-ended, historically informed research process, a methodological procedure, including the practice of coding and comparative architecture analysis, is the subject of the section Methodological Considerations and Theory. Here a link is being made with grounded theory, as well as with philosophy and hermeneutics, discussing a deeper and epistemological level of interpretation. The practicing concrete examples of real-world phenomena informs theoretization, abstract models of real-world phenomena, and vice versa. The section, the connection, researcher architect, finally explains how there is an intrinsic link between the system of inquiry and the development of the five interpretive lenses and a theoretical sensitivity derived through teaching architecture analysis through many years. The interdisciplinarity of my work field as a designer in the world of arts and culture has furthermore been of importance for the way in which architecture is being perceived from multifarious perspectives. The idea of being able to describe architecture from different viewpoints, like seeing the world through different glasses or walking through the same building five times, but in another condition, has a performative quality, which links it back to my experiences as a designer in the world of performance arts. Performance arts. Last but not least, the epilogue stresses the importance of including practitioners into academia to give them the opportunity to reflect upon practice, thereby constructing a bridge between the world of academia and the world of practice, research thinking in and about architecture. The scheme on the right side depicts the system of inquiry, the methodological thinking tool. The five vertical lines equals an analysis with the use of one of the five lenses. Each lens is representative of one epistemological paradigm, a way of understanding and being in the world. Together, the paradigmatic model of the five interpretive lenses can be used to analyze, interpret, and discuss the discipline of architecture as a system of five different but interrelated knowledge fields, which eat their meaning, roles, architectural means, and responsibility as an architect. The basic ontological premise for this type of research is that there are 
multiple socially constructed realities. The corresponding epistemological position is that it is neither possible nor necessarily desirable for research to establish a value-free objectivity. Several worlds coexist depending on the interpretation. Considering the three premises described previously, architecture being the production of objects of art, a materialization of a relationship, a process, and a social, cultural, and historical artifact, each analysis is divided into three parts, a media analysis, an analysis of the decision-making process, and an analysis of the historical and societal connotation depicted in the middle of the scheme. Essentially, the methodological thinking tool is a way to systematically think about research data and to relate data in complex ways. But the purpose of it is not to provide a methodological solution to or rules for design, but to offer a critical and reflective frame of thought, systems of interpretations and examples of different attitudes and types in the discipline. It could be seen as the starting point for discussion of the relationship between practice and academia, between practice and education, or all three of them. The system of the five interpretive lenses has through the years been developed into a classification system. This slide shows the two pages in the paper in which I explain how the analytical classification system relate to the realm and perspective of people in practice. The analytical categories of the five lenses are, one, building culture, materialization, constructional spaces, two, use, organization, distribution of activities, three, social relations, hierarchy, power, and bonds, four, representation, imagery, narrative, and five, experience, imagination, memory. The five interpretive lenses portray how architects do not operate within one worldview, one reality, but simultaneously in several worldviews. In addition, my analytical framework also suggests that what architecture is and what architects do differs following the way you look at it. Last but not least, applied as a tool in architecture analysis, the five inter interpretive lenses can act as a way to surface perceptions of reality, space, place, behavior, and sense-making that are different in one part of the world and our culture, where doors, windows, passages, and thresholds are not being interpreted the same way, depending on the cultural background and lay perspective of the person perceiving. This slide is an example of the definition of one of the lenses, lens three, the social aspect of architecture. In this worldview, reality is seen as a social construction. He humans are social actors in a network of contact and exchange, power and bonds. In practice, architects refer to this paradigm when they talk about how their architecture can support or hinder people's behavior and movement in space, as well as their interconnection, contact, and relation with others. The perspective leads to the analysis of the social aspects of architecture, how an architectural scheme can influence direct and manifest social relations, rituals, and hierarchies between people. Key aspects in an analysis with this interpretive lens would be ordering, accessibility, ownership, size and hierarchy, territorial demarcations, boundaries, clustering versus separations, segregation versus integration, public versus private and intimate, formal versus informal, location and relation between people, power and bonds, roots and use through the building, social rituals. This part of the classification system thus establishes a link with design practice, describing the means an architect can use while designing a building seen from the viewpoint of the specific lens. The last two pages in the paper gives an example of how lens three can be made operational in research. On the right page, you see the social analysis from Appendix B of the three hospitals. On the left page, you find a description of what I learned by comparing the social aspect of the three hospitals and the matter of the role of the architect in the decision-making process. Besides, I give an example of the analysis of the social aspect of architecture, in this case, of Kommune from 1863, designed by the Danish architect Christian Hensen, saying, the time within which Kommune Hospitalet was built was marked by social anxieties. Home industries and small-scale farming were 
threatened by mechanization and industrialization. Work could be found in factories in the city, but there was no social security should one become unemployed, handicapped or sick. In addition, the migration of people moving from the countryside to the city meant that families could not help each other. Homeless people, orphan children, prostitutes, beggars, thieves, and human degradation was just part of the daily life in the city. This was of great concern for many people, which led to social in initiatives, rules, and regulations. If you look at Comunos Betele from the perspective of these social relationships, you suddenly see how it, in its spatial distribution, was governed by the need for control and supervision. Hierarchy and class issues were also expressed in the segregation of people. So was the hospital a gated community, which could only be accessed during visiting hours. Men and women were kept apart. The staff was distributed in accordance with rank and seniority. Patients were grouped in relation to how much they could pay for their visit, which in reality meant that richer people could get more privacy and care. And while the patients were there, they would su be supervised by nurses if they were not subject to the medical observation by the doctors. But where does this leave the architect? How much did they decide on? Could the spacious wards, the beautiful cross walls and daylight in the kitchen and laundry room, for example, be seen as a social gesture, a token of awareness that these people were seen and appreciated? Overall speaking, the historical study of the patient areas show how hierarchies and class issues have been translated into the hospital domain in, for example, the separation of rich and poor people. The position of the nurse within the hospital scheme was in the same way related to economic and political developments within society, but also to gender issues, female emancipation, the development of the nurse profession and their struggle to gain power within the institutional system. The staff hierarchy, which is to be read from all the planned drawings and sections, extended beyond that of the doctor-nurse relationship. Another issue was the position and identity of the patients who historically went through a transformation from being perceived as material to patient, patient and medical case to finally an equal human being. And all of this is to be read from the buildings, from studying the buildings. Um, and actually, I would like to stop here. I have one last slide. I don't know if you have the energy for it, but it's just to conclude some questions that we might be uh, that we could maybe discuss saying, um, and I have three minutes, I see. So to conclude, I have on the last slide included some statements as an invitation to discuss saying, there is no exact characterization in the discipline of architecture and research methodology, which leaves it open for interpretation. This leads to misconceptions, confusion, and mistakes in and around the field about what architecture is, what architects do, and how to talk about it. An analytical methodological thinking tool, like my five interpretive lenses, offers another view on the role of the architect, which, if used well, could open fields of new opportunities and interdisciplinary challenges for architects while making lay people see the complexity of the discipline. Another statement goes like this. People in practice could become better at explaining how they think, act, and work. Embedded into my methodological work is this indirect critique of the architectural discourse as it, is, as it is most commonly done by architects, focusing on the material side of objects. Methodological research is a way to bypass this professional bias, to challenge conventions, opening multifarious perspectives. And last but not least, the practice perspective is missing in literature and architecture. Instead, architecture is portrayed as an aesthetical object of art, the illustration of theory, the consequence of history, and our social cultural circumstances. In order for this to change, architectural research needs to include a discussion of the design paradigm, ways to understand design, designing, and the role of designers in the development of projects. For this reason, practitioners should be invited into academia to do research on practice. So this was my presentation. I hope it was possible to follow. Thank you, uh, Birgitte. Um, it was a very clear, clear presentation and very interesting one. And I think it raises uh, immediately um, food for thought and food for discussion. So I would like That's to invite good. everybody to hold on to questions. Oh, sure. and, um, 
Yeah, you need to unshare. Yeah. Uh, of course, you can, you can ask anything. These were just things I thought would, for me would be interesting. To no, do. I think uh, they are most relevant issues. Um, but okay. I suggest that everybody yeah. can, you know, hold on, hold yes, on yes, to yes. their questions until the end. Um, um, we'll stop. check the, the chat box um, when we start the discussion. Um, so we go further now. Um, and I want to check in with... Um, Sophia, because there might have been a problem there with uh, sound. Um, Sophia, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, that's fine. Great, I had to move around in my flat because my neighbor is cutting the grass of her garden. So that's <laughs> one of the problems in the pandemic era. <laughs> so I'm sharing my screen now. Yes. Can you see it? Yes. Uh, so uh, shall I click play from start? Yes, you can uh, go ahead. Okay, so... Uh, thank you very much for uh, putting together a very exciting uh, conference. I've been enjoying all the presentations uh, yesterday and today. So um, I will start um, my presentation, uh, which uh, is called The Building Within the City, uh, seeking a congruence between the autonomy of architecture and the evolutionary reform of the city. Architecture is usually defined by the humanistic idea of authorship and the individual creativity of the designer. In contrast, the large body of buildings and cities where social life takes place is considered as the collective outcome of socioeconomic processes over time. This difference separates the social purpose of individual uh, architectural works from the collective architectural and urban production, fragmenting architecture into different fields of knowledge. The one side in the debate sees architecture as liberal art, the other as part of the empirical paradigm method. The opposition of individual and collective production contains another binary, the material reality consisting of buildings and cities versus design as a domain of possible configurations and hypothetical structures. I will address the theoretical questions behind these binaries. Where does architectural knowledge come from? Are architecture and the city defined by the creative imagination alone or by multiple external influences and factors? Using the example of Venice and authored works inspired by it, I will propose an expanded view of architecture, the city, historiography, and spatial morphology, opening up the original oppositions to multiple overlapping definitions of authorship and, and spatial production. These dichotomies are deeply rooted in Western theories of knowledge, but they are also accentuated by the trajectories of architectural schools and pedagogical cultures. My studies illuminated by my personal experience as a postgraduate student at the Advanced Architectural Studies Unit at the Bartlett in the 80s and 90s. The AAS unit was one of the research units established by Llewellyn Davis, who as a professor of architecture at the school, set out in the 60s to develop a research-based foundation for architectural education in close connection with the social, material, and environmental studies. From 1961 to 1991, the research heritage of the Bartlett was firmly set on the rational epistemological paradigm. Taking the position of the architectural profession in 1991, Peter Cook radically changed the direction of the school from a rational approach to artistic experimentation and from the horizontal system of year cohorts to the vertical microcosms of atelier units. Cook's radical changes were not isolated phenomena. Based on the idea of architectural creativity, architectural education is often defined through the individual imagination. In contrast, the large body of buildings and building arrangements that constitute cities are considered as the results of socioeconomic processes. This is the contrasting views of the world, defining architecture through the arts and humanities on the one hand and the social and environmental sciences on the other. At the part of faculty, a number of research programs in building science, city science, and spatial morphology adopt the empirical epistemology method. Inaugurated around 2000, the design PhD program at the School of Architecture defines design through architectural research and interdisciplinary interactions. In essence, though, it is also characterized by the artistic humanistic model of knowledge. This dichotomy fragments architectural education in many programs around the world, where each side in the debate thinks it has the right approach, or at least a better approach than the other. The binary of individual inspiration versus architecture that emerges from empirical factors external to architecture's modes of thought and the creative imagination belongs to a wider list of philosophical binaries, such as form and function, form and meaning, mind and body, they appear in an intensified form in the Renaissance with a clear demarcation 
of architecture away from artisanal building traditions. Binaries construct oscillation between two notions critically opening questions. How is the architectural work conceived? Are architectural knowledge and authorship found outside conscious architecture or are they actively invented from within? I will explore these questions by looking first at the logical paradoxes inherent in them, using some built examples and unrealized designs. I will then discuss conscious architecture and structures that are untamed by conscious design intentions, which we can be characterized as found. If we support the view that architecture is autonomous, we accept that ideas originate within the architect's mind or ways of thinking that are internal to the design practice. If on the other hand, we believe that architecture is contingent on external factors, such as socioeconomic conditions, historical influences, socio-technical innovation, then it remains impervious to the discipline of the designer. For Mark Kjellerte, if a theory can explain the role of the creative author in the generation of form, then he cannot explain how individuals seem to fall under the coercive influence of a prevailing style or a dominant ideology. Equally, if the theory accounts for how architects attend their idiosyncrasies of context, it cannot explain why they often generate versions of familiar forms throughout history for many different functions and contexts. We can practically pick and choose one of these positions or combine both, but how can we really avoid falling within a narrow um, uh, paradigm, particularly when the complexities of architecture demand rich uh, rather than impoverished positions? For Gelente, such problems originate in our philosophical heritage on a conceptual paradox deeply embedded in the Western system of knowledge. Known to philosophers as the subject-object problem or the body-mind problem, this dualism is responsible for similar confusions in many other fields, including psychology and philosophy of science. This paradox has its origins in the innovations of the ancient Greeks, who devised a cosmological system that later evolved into a theory of knowledge or in other words, an epistemological system. This system suffered from a dualistic conception of the individual, allowing two simultaneous but mutually exclusive interpretations. On the one hand, the individual is a physical object in nature whose actions are completely determined as with all other physical objects by universal laws. On the other hand, the individual is a creative subject acting from their own personal desires and motivations free from external influence. Designers identify themselves with the creative side of this equation, epistemologists, epistemologists with the opposite. The underlying ambiguity of this subject has often allowed the fusion of these two sides. There are theories of architectural creation resembling theories of knowledge and vice versa. I will now move to the humanist idea of authorship, marking the beginning of modernity in the Renaissance. The theories of Alberti, Serio, Palladio established two things. First, the superior status of the design original to the collective, non-designed and tacit systems through which cities and buildings are produced without conscious design intention or a singular center of knowledge. Second, the superiori superiority of the design original to variations to which the original might be subjected through use and over time. As Mario Carpo explains, with Alberti, design revisions stop when design stops. So the design of the building became the original and the building its identical copy. The Alberti model has deeper and wider repercussions than this. It confers the superior status of architectural design to buildings and cities as found, because they are mosaics of accidents, adaptations, adjustments, additions, subtractions, revisions, and other errors, most significantly by lacking an identifiable author. We recognize the notion of collective architecture in Rem Kulha's 2014 Biennale. Presenting doors, windows, and other architectural components, the exhibition implied that architecture is the byproduct of market forces over and above conscious intentions. A similar idea was put forward in Delirious New York, reading Manhattan as self organized framework, optimizing the economic and programmatic potential of skyscrapers. Discussing the skyscraper island as an empirical cityscape without a manifesto and privileging large scale building production over individual architects and their design, Kul has put forward a view of architecture as an evolutionary system that is blind to the final outcome of design. In contrast, the model of architecture developed by Alberti is clear in its design intention, but blind to evolutionary process. Equally passionate about Manhattan's evolved diversity was Jane Jacobs, describing the city as an empirical framework of organized complexity. A similar idea was used in architecture by Alison Smithson through the notion of match building, the adaptable aggregate configurations of the anonymous collective. 
These approaches point to the gap between buildings that spring from architectural conception and those that are evolved in response to functional demands and the particularities of place. They also highlight a difference between empirical, Jacobs, conceptual, Kuhas, and design, Smithson's modes of refining architectural knowledge. From planning codes and infrastructures to the absence of planning regulations and rapid urbanization, there is a growing gap between the artistic aspirations of architects and the systemic operation of architecture as it happens on the ground. In the 70s, Mafredo Tafuri argued that capitalism had stripped architecture from its ideological purpose. Today, the schism between the architectural avant-garde, land values and profit has turned architecture to a mere exercise of form without utopia. But if architecture is to have social agency, we need to address social significance in both authored buildings and authored structures. Like the 20th century metropolis, Venice has for centuries provided a laboratory for invention. I have chosen it for two additional reasons. First, it is about the intersection of collective organic growth and conscious design intention expressed in the medieval urban fabric, the monuments and major public spaces of the city. Second, it was the center of Vitruvian studies, decisively opening to the Renaissance and architectural authorship in the 15th century. So it can illuminate the interaction of architecture as autonomous field with factors that are external to the conceptual operations of design. I will discuss Venice separately, and then in, collab in relation to the Venice Hospital by Le Corbusier, Carlo Scarpa Olivetti Sorum, uh, the Castel Vecchio, and the uh, extension to the Gipsoteca Canoviana. If we look at the dense network of spaces in Venice, we see that the squares, or campi as they are known in Venice, are densely interconnected in ways that it's possible to move between them through circular routes, returning to a square through a different pathway. The majority of the squares are directly accessible from a canal and an alley, which suggests that there are nodes in the intersection between the two movement systems. This property captures the memory of the city as evolutionary process from an archipelago to a city. Uh, the squares with their churches were the so social nuclei of Paris islands, semi-autonomous community centers that had a market and served communication between islands by being directly accessible by the lagoon's waters. The Campi were also centers of water collection through wells at the center of each square. The continuous network of routes suggests that the bridges that connect islands were built so as to link the squares with each other, forming a network of multiple interconnected centralities. As the city developed new land, local functional needs, such as dual access from land and water, and social needs, such as the redistribution of land ownership and privileges of physical access, led to the interconnected squares with large-scale consequences to the organization of the city as a whole. Another fundamental characteristic of the squares is that they consist of recurring composite structures of urban elements, such as square, church, well, canal, bridge, loading steps. The repetition of these elements in the squares of Venice and the repetition of the squares themselves in the city lead to a recognizable order without conscious intention. I will argue that the structure of these networks and the evolutionary logic of the city influences Le Corbusier's hospital and Scarpa's designs. The analysis of the hospital shows an analogical relationship with the networks of Venice through a system of pathways, which Le Corbusier calls Calais, in a direct analogy with the alleys of Venice, intersecting at the center of Unité de Batiste, called Campiello, in an analogy with the squares of Venice. Corbusier's hospital is an analogical expression of the networks of Venice, creatively interpreting the city in a new design reality. Scarpa's projects, on the other hand, are not shaped like a network, but take a lot first from the ways in which Venice's streets and canals shape moving and viewing, and second from the evolutionary growth of Venice, reconciling various stages of built form through a logic of accretion. In the Olivetti showroom, for example, we encounter a series of techniques splitting a narrow site into three long strips. This creates a directional form of movement, traveling to the back of the space at the ground floor, returning to the center in order to ascend to the mezzanine level. In order to see the entire layout, one has to turn direction 10 times, a complex pattern of circulation for such a small size of space. By punctuating the floor, the ceilings, the horizontal and vertical surfaces with different types of materials, Scarpa creates distinct thresholds. The linear progression through space is thus staged as a sequence through clearly demarcated episodes or chapters. A linear course of movement with many directional turns also characterizes the Castel Vecchio, meandering along the linear stretch of the building and around the exhibits, as it is never possible to confront them frontally or survey all the works all at once. This can be also seen in the Gipsoteca. Sorry, I lost my, my point. I am. Um, 
through my text. Contrasting the long axis in the original gallery with the organization of space and display in Scarpa's extension. There are statues of different scale placed on different shaped pedestals. Some works portray declining figures, other seated ones. Some are best busts, while others represent full bodies. Instead of being tucked against the wall in a linear progression of space as in the old building, they are set at different spatial points. To view all these works requires circumnavigating them, changing the initial impression of the predominance of seeing everything at once, as in the old gallery, over moving around spaces and objects. In all three works of Scarpa, the storehouse of inspiration is Venice. The linear splicing of space in the Olivetti showroom, the sculptural staircase in the water in the central zone, are mediated references to the great catalogue of forms that is Venice, with its narrow passages, the fundamentals, the sort of porticos, the bridges stretching over the water, the water flood in the edges of space, all featuring as references to the aquatic city where Scarpa spent most of his life. Equally significant is the influence of the ways in which seen and going are organized in Venice, the synchronicity of views over the water combined by the protracted courses of movement one has to take in order to cross sometimes the shortest distances between points in, ta in time. Critics interpret Scarpa's work as a metonymic articulation of found fragments, metonymic being a term that describes the capacity of a fragment to express the whole. We are in Nelson Goodman's third category in terms of how buildings mean, that is exemplification by metaphoric or metonymic expression, defining properties not possessed by work but expressed by the work. Scarpa's tectonic poetry was brought into being by the Venetian constructive ability to reconcile discrete building elements of disparate origin. The Venetians built most of their city using uh, building spoils that came from the trading routes. And one example, as Marco Frascari explains, is San Sebastiano, where the uh, columns on the top floor are much shorter than those at the bottom because they were found objects that came from another structure. Unlike other modern architects, Scarpa left behind no memorial plans, but a series of layered drawings, mechanisms for his thoughts, rather than a set of instructions to, to builders of a finished object. While they representing a unity of craft and design, this approach has been criticized for lacking an overall unifying concept. The preference for iconic drawings and overall concepts is a preference developed since the Renaissance treaties, alongside the notions of authorship and the relationship between parts and whole. Scarpa did not have academic training in architecture. Venice for him was a laboratory of combinatorial tectonic possibility, unaffected by the academic tradition or impulse for composition and the whole part relationship. The artifacts I have discussed have a logic based on local scale rules that it's either recursive or based on metonymic tectonic translations or spatial translations of bodily movement as in the case of Scarpa projects. They can explain morphogenetic processes that work from ground up and from the part of the whole and vice versa. The morphological affinities between these works suggest that there are multiple heterogeneous intersecting forms of authorship influencing each other. The horizontal axis in the diagram captures variations based on whether artifacts are built or have a virtual presence. The vertical axis registers variations of evolutionary processes with and without conscious intention. The four squares indicate structures of different scale, buildings, building complexes, cities, and landscape. Works by Palladio, Sansovino, and Scarpa can be placed at the top right corner, which stands for built structures carrying the signature of an author. Venice is in the bottom right corner, which stands for built structures carrying the, the uh, uh, which stands for built structures that are mainly the outcome of collective processes. The hospital is at the top left side as a design building complex, which was not realized. Sforzinda by Filarete and other fantastic constructions fall in the same quadrant with the hospital, characterized by conscious intention, accessible only through mental perception. In contrast, the ideal city of Palmanova is in the opposite quadrant, a designed and built city of the Venetian Republic at the end of Renaissance. Finally, hybrid cases such as mass speculative architecture coincide with the right side of the x-axis, designed by architects but lacking creative intention. Similarly, digital designs through collaborative algorithmic forms of authorship collapse on the left side of the x-axis. Once we have the concept of the alternative intersecting forms of authorship, we can explain how society and culture enter designed and non-designed artifacts built in virtual environments, empirically understood and mentally accessed structures. The examples of Le Corbusier's hospitals and Scarpa's work help us see how cities like Venice inspire architecture and what they draw out of architecture. 
and out of buildings. Returning to the questions raised at the beginning of the paper, I hope to have shown that when architectural research continues to be exclusively rooted to the model developed by Alberti or the empirical model of science or oscillate without theorization between the two, it is difficult to bridge the individual and the collective imagination. Perpetuating the definition of architecture as high art or the mechanistic functional order of empirical evidence without recognizing the imaginative and the virtual dimensions of the artistic mind removes the capacity of architecture to actively contribute to the creative socio-political processes of everyday life. We need new educational and theoretical models for architectural research, the seeds of which are contained within the educational heritage of many schools but are trapped in their institutional and epistemological frameworks. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia, for this uh, fascinating lecture. May I invite you to um, unshare the screen? Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Thank you. Sharing. Thank you. And so I'll give the floor now to uh, Joseph Bedford. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's great to be here at a great conference, uh, hearing fascinating work by colleagues. I will make four claims in this paper about the effects of our increasingly post-literate age upon architectural discourse. In contrast to written discourse during the literate age of print media, an image discourse during the post-literate age of social media has these four properties. Um, it transforms life increasingly into work. It displaces authorship evermore. It disaggregates the complete work, let's say, of a building at a certain scale. And it increases the tendency towards ambiguity in communication. So I'll make these claims through uh, four all too brief readings of four architects that operate successfully in the realm of Instagram. I'll attempt to develop how I see each of these effects as being correlated with, if not caused by, the shift towards a post-literate form of discourse on the web or through apps like Instagram. All these effects are, in my view, problematic because they disestablish the discipline building function of discourse. I say this because the activity of discipline building requires unambiguous authorial intent invested in complete works of a certain scale that are distinguishable, which is to say autonomous, to use an old fashioned word, from instrumentalization uh, of the economy. Instagram, uh, which I'll focus on, offers only a very weak non-disciplinary form of discoursing in architecture, which is limited to the cultivation of signaling of judgment within cultures of taste. Its sprawling form fails to construct any singular symbolic moments that might advance the discipline and which might be read and debated through processes of critical deliberation. There are many other factors disestablishing discipline building within our field, uh, if not culture more broadly, such as the quantification metrics and precariousness that predominate under neoliberal models of governance. Yet media technical change in the way that we discourse is certainly one of these factors. A public discourse has recently emerged around the negative effects of communication capitalism on individual autonomy Shoshana Zuboff's Surveillance Capitalism, Jaron Lanier's Ten Arguments, and Richard Seymour's The Twittering Machine have all analyzed the cultural effects of the business model behind tech giants like Google, Twitter, and Facebook. They've argued that our business model operates by penetrating ever deeper into the attentional and cognitive resources of individuals through designed addiction to personal devices, by amassing and analyzing big data, and by selling targeted advertising. It's a model that not only predicts users desires and actions by surveillance, but by behaviorist manipulation. 
architects have certainly been affected by information capitalism as uh, consumers of this new media and degraded in their capacities to read and write, reflect and analyze by the logic of distraction, the rhythm of constant stimulation, flashing banners, autoplay videos, looping GIFs, robotic clicking, the proliferation of tabs and endless searching. Yet architects have also been affected by information capitalism as producers with it working within the new media. Their mode of cultural production has been subject to a new casualization. It's no longer filtered so clearly by institutions like schools and galleries or the power broking of journals and critics. It's easier today for emerging architects without a body of work to build an audience through the new logic of social media influencing. They can drip feed a wide range of content, buildings, installations, models, photographs, or scans of found objects to generate many thousands of followers. Yet, as architects invest their time and energy into this strategy of mediation, they fuel a media form that inherently disestablishes the discipline as a communicatively rational, historical form of inquiry. They replace the role of authored intentionality and created works with the idea of hive production, networks and infinite recombinations of purposefully hesitant and ambiguous messages. While speaking of the recent work of young architects in the United States, the editors of the book uh, Possible Mediums have tried to describe this shift though without a critical perspective on it. They write, the rapid circulation of online images has replaced the polished presentations common of earlier media forms, such as print. This creates a messy and fecund state of sharing work, facilitated by free-flowing and far-reaching platforms of social media. As a result, design starts to resemble a collective hive mind, more than a traditional notion of author. A more critical view of what they call fake, a fecund state of sharing is instead offered by Jaron Lanier in You're Not a Gadget, where he has discussed the same phenomena in a more critical light as the increasing discretization and decontextualization of culture that pioneered by Apple in 2001 with the development of the iPod and MP3 and generalized today as a culture of recombined and mashed up snippets of existing content, which for Lanier fails to enable original individual creativity. So where the editors of Possible Mediums present the hive mind as a positive development, Lanier offers a critical analysis of the totalitarian forms of power which exist within the platforms that profit from it. Let me offer four examples of architects whose work and Instagram feeds are emblematic of the new media and its effects on cultural production within architecture. Bureau Spectacular, which illustrates the effect of transforming life into work. Office Kovacs, which illustrates the displacement of authorship. Atelier Fala, which illustrates the disaggregation of discrete works of architecture. And finally, uh, Moss, and um, in particular, uh, Michael Meredith, which illustrates the predominance of ambiguity. So firstly, the young Los Angeles-based architecture practice Bureau Spectacular illustrates for us the relation between the new media discourse and the larger culture of quote-unquote influencers. Their 14.6 thousand followers on Instagram is modest in contrast to the 1.1 million followers of Zaha Hadid architects, Yet for a small practice with little built work, it's significant and far more influential than most personal Instagram accounts. Like many personal Instagram feeds, theirs includes uh, photographs of finished work, finished objects, magazine covers uh, featuring their work and the finished drawings. But it also includes images that cross over and blur the boundary between life and work, presenting not only work in progress shots of the office, often populated by employees clearly having fun, but also personal images like selfies, selfies with celebrity architects and their cat and the food that they're eating. 
The blurred relationship between the cultural and social sphere on the one hand and the economic sphere on the other is made explicit by Bureau Spectacular's post, which reads, we've been selected to become a life water influencer, exclamation mark. Life Water is a designer brand owned by Pepsi. And by accepting uh, product placement into their feed, Bureau Spectacular exemplify the collapse of life into work. In Franco Bifo Berardi's terms, they put their soul to work. They give over their personal affectations, their character, their social reputation to economic exchange. For Berardi, what he calls uh, semio-capitalism. In, in semio-capitalism, our labor is increasingly made individual and personal because we perform increasingly skilled and creative forms of production, which cannot be exchanged with, with others, unlike uh, mechanical labor of previous centuries. For digital laborers, according to Berardi, labor becomes, quote, the most essential part of their lives, uh, the most specific and the most personalized. So making personalized posts about life water in their feed, Bureau Spectacular make explicit the fact that in today's semi-capitalism, culture has become indistinguishable from economy. An individual creation and authorship, uh, in the sense that we still might think of creativity or auth and authorship as inherently free of instrumentality or the economy, it's become simply another moment of production. In the casualization of production, there becomes little difference between producing and consuming, labor and thought, feeling and affect. Secondly, in the case of Office Kovacs, we see the collapse of the difference between authored work and the reassembly of existing or found content. Kovacs' initial body of work was almost exclusively based on reposting the images of existing buildings. He built his following by digitizing rare archival content, but also content considered to be uh, lowbrow, kitsch, or in his terms, B-side. He selects and arranges these existing fragments in new ways to create new assemblages. Sometimes the work emerges from the literal use and careful recontextualization of found objects by placing them um, by placing items sourced from dollar stores, hardware stores, or on eBay next to one another, often with a scaled figure, uh, in order to transform them into an architectural representation. Sometimes the work emerges from the exaggerated assembly of many such objects into mountainous forms. In each of these cases, whether small or large assemblages, the traditional role of architectural authorship, conceived as the creation of an intentional language, disappears. There's no architectural language in the sense of a syntax of repeated compositional elements that carry coherent intention and contextually determined meanings. There's no criteria of judgment that one could use to decide which composition is better than another, whether the duck is next to the egg or below the red pepper. And as a result, one could imagine an infinite variety of equally valid rearrangements. It's a body of work that does not ask to be read in terms of its intentions or its context. Unlike the paper, unbuilt and sightless projects of figures like Eisman or Haydock in previous decades, Kovacs's work does not prompt its reader to ask, what is the author trying to say? Thirdly, Atelier Fala operate in a way that rejects not the role of the author, but the role of the architectural work as a discrete unit. Um, the building, particularly, as a discrete moment of cultural production operating at a certain scale. They circulate images of discrete moments, be it a photograph of a corner of a room with a sink and some tiles, or a derealized flat collage of room made from cutouts of objects, surfaces, and figures uh, from colored paper, textures, and paintings. They do not intend their audience to be able to easily correlate their different representations to the actual building uh, which they might represent. So here I'm gathering three separate images that might appear in completely different places in the feed uh, to show you that they're actually three images of the same building. 
but it would take you a while to work this out. Rather, they separate, uh, and here's some more uh, making the same point, rather they celebrate the fact that the work is a quote unquote network of repeated parts. Some of this is simply a reflection of the new media in which feeds inherently disaggregate bits of content. Yet, uh, symptomatically, they've embraced this logic of decontextualized fragmentation in their website. If you click on an image, you will not see the project in more detail, as you might expect from other architects' websites. Instead, you'll be presented with another reshuffled grid of images, images of mirrors, columns, curved surfaces, kitchen hats, etc. You'll not be able to correlate plan, section, elevation, axonometric, and perspective in the traditional manner in order to represent the building as a whole. Finally, Michael Meredith and Moss Architects has recently attempted to write about the work of uh, this generation of architects, emphasizing their resort to increasingly calculated forms of communicative ambiguity, given the media saturated environment in which they work. On the one hand, Michael Meredith has reflected on the changes in the discourse, which is, he has witnessed as involving precisely a shift in media from practices of reading and writing towards practices of the production and circulation of images. Of the 1990s, he observes, quote, we read almost anything related to critical theory, whatever that was published by zone, semiotext, or verso. And we read journals, any assemblage October. We read a lot, end quote. Of the present, by contrast, he observes, quote, all positions have become relative. Individual and institution alike are atomized into an array of indeterminate positions. We all take part in the architectural potluck consuming the very same images. All our references belong to a global market of intellectualism, uh, whatever is available." End quote. Meredith has also attempted to account for the attitude of young architects working with, within this media condition, including himself, as being inherently more ambiguous or ironic, or in his terms, indifferent. Artistic expression, he says, today is, quote, uh, one of no expression of calculated ambiguity, uh, sorry, of calculated indifference. To calculate one's indifference remains, of course, highly discursive. As Meredith puts it in another essay, I subscribe to Wolf linear models of art history or architectural history. I believe in comparison. I believe in everything being a conversation. How do we look at work together? How do we discuss it? He still holds to an enlightenment model of the discipline as a kind of public sphere. Yet this discursive culture becomes only about judgments of taste and not reason uh, because such discussion is advanced through the circulation of images, which are in my view, inherently laconic in contrast to words and especially susceptible to ambiguity and irony rather than uh, through the long form writing, which demands clarity and argument. So it, it's precisely the laconic nature of the image that has defined its recent centrality to our form of discourse. The image is inherently ambiguous. Digital natives circulate memes precisely because it is never quite clear what is intended by them. When we search for GIF to share with friends on WhatsApp or social media, we translate clear words into ambiguous images. And the significance of the communication lays then primarily not in our forms of reason, but in our selection, we might say our consumption, and in signaling of taste that comes with consumer choices. The images shared by Meredith's firm, Moss, on their Instagram feed are thus not simply works, but expressions of their own selection of what representations of their work to show. The choice to, find, to show a finished building, but also precisely chosen sketches, publications of work laid out 
uh, in a calculatedly ambiguous way on the desk, numbered rocks, amusing sets of cabinets, job postings, advertising a boring project, all signal a highly refined taste. The success of Instagram for designers is arguably that a collection of chosen images works more rapidly than written posts to communicate whether someone is a person or not, to do a kind of Turing test on someone that started following you, and to um, communicate whether or not um, that person has a kind of taste that you can assess rapidly uh, within a fraction of a second and decide whether or not you want to be associated with them. This distinction at play in such moments is based precisely on calculated ambiguity. The more ambiguous, the more refined and subtle the process of judgment and taste. Making this new sensibility a product of the new media and making the new media central in pushing the discourse ever further towards this new sensibility. So in conclusion, architects thus still discourse about their work. They communicate today perhaps more than they ever have on a larger scale and far more broadly. Yet the new media has changed the nature of the discourse and it works to frustrate the old ways in which discourse builds discipline. In some architects like others are distracted and cognitive mani cognitively manipulated like all citizens in semi-capitalism. They take part in casualized production in which life becomes work and culture becomes economics. But they even celebrate in too many cases the loss of authorship and architectural language and the creation of discrete works, replacing these moments by a collective hive mind, a drip feed, a network, or an infinitely equivalent recombination of parts. They compare and make judgments, but not the kinds of judgments that are then argued through reasoned critical debate in spoken or written form. Instead, they're judgments of taste that function as consumer choice to signal identity within a vast cacophony of human and non-human cultural producers and consumers. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Joseph, for a also a very rich uh, lecture. Um, I think we have uh, three presentations that um, combine well because they make, um, well, kind of clear observations on, on what issues are at stake at the moment in discussing architecture or in researching architecture and architectural practice. And um, perhaps, uh, so you're all there, I see now. Yes, thank you. Um, perhaps I could open the discussion uh, by first saying that also the public who is listening can post uh, questions in the chat box, so we keep an eye on that. But perhaps I can open the, the discussion with uh, one of the issues that Birgitte raised uh, on her final slide being her observation that, um, well, there is no exact characterization, if I recall well, of the methodology or methodology of um, researching uh, architecture or, or of analyzing uh, architectural practice. In a way, um, Birgitte, you want to, you're responding to that observation by proposing um, a scheme for analysis. Um, Particularly, I think, if I understand well, to analyze the role of the architect in, in the production of, of uh, architecture. Um, and of course, Sophia also presents a scheme uh, more to address the, the, the role of um, authorship or to talk about authorship in architecture. Um, and so I'm actually wondering, um, or I would like to pose the question to the three of you. Do you agree with um, Begitte's statement that uh, we need a more precise uh, discussion on methodology? And then perhaps another question related to that. Um, seeing the three presentations of you here together, um, two of you really use examples which you could say are, are more of a historical nature. Um, in the sense that they relate to the 20th century. And of course, we have this interesting uh, bridge here to the observation that Joseph makes about more contemporary architectural practices. So 
also there if your schemes would be in a kind of response to um, the need for more me methodology how how um, useful would the, the, the schemes that you have developed be for a more contemporary practice? I don't know if, if uh, who of you wants to respond first. Well, uh, maybe I can say something mm -hmm. because it's, it's uh, the point of, of this classification system which I developed is not the scheme in itself. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's what I called a methodological thinking tool Mm -hmm. The purpose of is it is actually to uh, to give also lay people um, the possibility to access actually what architects uh, are working with. And as an example, I, I mentioned I work with uh, the study or research in the hospital sector, and what's uh, pretty evident there is that uh, the territory of um, the work field for architects is kind of limiting it's, it's becoming smaller and smaller architects have less and less to say while you, if you also look at the arguments they place it's not really very clear what is it actually that they bring to the table in in terms of you know when you sit with your client when you sit with the other partners in the decision process so what i'm trying to say is just that i think that it would benefit architects and also lay people in general or people <laughs> Who are interested in architecture if the terminology could become more clear you know if it be, would become more clear for people including architects what are we actually talking about and when are we talking about it you know so that other people can also access the discussion uh, let's say you talk about the organization of certain activities in the hospital you need to make it clear what is it that you as an architect can do what are your means uh, so and that's what I mean, that there are different knowledge fields within the architecture, uh, architectural discipline. It's not one thing. And I think it's a problem generally that when architects speak, they mingle a lot of things together. And in general, when they talk about their projects, they don't talk about the role that they had in the development of the project, meaning it's not necessarily something you can see, but maybe something in the organizational you know, uh, in the organization of activities or in social relationships or in the experiential uh, sphere. So it's just a means. It's not to say this is the way you should design, but I think there is a need for architects to kind of push back a little in the field of, of uh, reality and how big complex projects are actually made. Uh, that to take power, you know, to, to yeah, it's not a, against what Joseph is saying, because I think that's really, really interesting as well. <laughs> and I also see that problem in a way. I'm also really critical towards how architects actually position themselves. And I don't think they uh, are very clear on that matter. Was that? Yes, more or less. I'm wondering <laughs> if, I, if I may go back to the, the second part of my question. I wonder if, the, so the, I understand your your the aim of your scheme is also to, to clarify terminology and to, to raise issues. But because you've mainly used um, these three examples, I think now from, for, from three examples from hospitals that have been built in the 20th century, I was, I was trying to, to make a kind of bridge to the more contemporary uh, production of architecture and especially the issues that Joseph raised. And I'm, 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 I'm just wondering if, um, the scheme you developed, if you see opportunities to, to include issues that, that Joseph raise, raises here. Definitely. I mean, but that would, uh, I mean, if, if we, uh, if we turn towards this, uh, what I call lens four, which is about representation and imagery, I think that's very much what, what you're talking about, Joseph, like uh, how images are being kind of shared and, and distributed uh, all around the globe, mm -hmm. which of course questions this whole idea of where does it come from and who's the author of this? And uh, it even questions uh, the whole definition of the discipline, you know, like, mm -hmm. like uh, what is it that we create and is architecture actually an autonomous discipline like that? Or is, is the architect, you know, the, the, the master architect that, that we kind of, we have, 
cultivated within our discipline this idea of the artist uh, uh, architect. But in a way, I think by looking at it in the distribution of images, which has, has to do with representation as well, you suddenly see that the world we live in today is defining architecture differently. I don't have a necessarily a problem with that. I, I was wanted to ask Joseph about this. Do you have a problem with this attack on uh, authorship? <laughs> Do you see architecture uh, as a collective discipline or do you see it as the work of art? Um, I see it as a collective discipline. Um, the the um, trope of denigrating the author is something that I think is quite old and I'm a little tired of. I think it plays into the hands of neoliberalism, which also, uh, you know, surveillance capitalism also um, by definition denigrates the author. So we, I think we as a field can, can stop replaying the Foucauldian uh, Barthian drama of, of the author and its death. I, I don't think, it depends on how you define authorship. I think if you define it as um, a kind of solipsism, then, then or narcissism, we wouldn't, we wouldn't want that because I think we'd all agree that we have kind of civic social ideals. But I do think authorship is kind of a moment of, I guess it's synonymous with a moment of communicating something in a certain original way, like authoring something that has a discrete um, reality that makes a symbolic difference. It's a very difficult thing to do. Um, Lanier says, Einstein made more contribution to human history than all the Wikipedia editors combined. And I think that moment, you know, Einstein is a kind of author creating something that really matters and that's really difficult work. Um, so in that sense, I defend that moment of authoring something. Yeah. Sophia, do you want to respond? Uh, uh, to your initial question regarding uh, whether we should become clearer with our methodologies. Yes. Um, and perhaps I can touch on some of these issues that uh, Brigitte and Joseph have mentioned. Um, I think that there are many different strands of architectural research, and this is what I was trying to show. They should not necessarily merge into one field of architectural research where everyone does uses all kinds of methods. Uh, the, the, the distinctions and the boundaries um, are, are very clear. It's difficult to cross the boundaries, but what is needed is a sort of awareness of the paradigmatic thinking structures that underline this kind of different approaches so that uh, there can be more interdisciplinary interactions that can really benefit. Design yeah. can benefit, architectural discourse can benefit the role of architecture in society, architectural agency and the role of the architect. Uh, regarding um, language and why architects uh, don't speak clearly. I think there's a clear need for architects to speak clearly in terms of public means of communication. Uh, but uh, the language plays multiple roles in architecture. Uh, it has a role to play in design and uh, it has certain um, functions of ambiguity that really benefit design. So we should again understand where certain needs are introduced. When we design, we might use the language ambiguously, like when we teach as well, because uh, ambiguity in language might really contain embody possibilities that can really facilitate alternative modes of thinking and pushing forward with your, one's ideas. But when we communicate with uh, other professionals or the public, then we definitely need to use uh, clear language uh, that will help the communication. Mm. Regarding the role of the image and the way in which the question authorships, um, I think definitely we're experiencing a revolution. Uh, the seeds of which could, could have been, uh, go really back in time with every technological revolution, uh, there are changes in architecture, there are changes in society and the role of architecture in society. So the printing press, it was a revolution and changed uh, architecture, brought the idea, helped for architecture to become liberal art because enabled people to really hold in their hands a printed book with plenty of images of all those monuments that were surveyed by Palladio and by Alberti through their travels to Rome and so on. And that kind of comparative understanding of the antiquity enabled the classical architects to become 
um, uh, uh, creative uh, with their discipline and distance the discipline from the artisanal modes of production. And then there was the age of uh, photography, which also brought another revolution. Now we are into another kind of revolution. But I don't think that only the image is what defines architecture. This is just a means of representation. So I will go back to the definition that Adrian Forti gives as of architecture as a three-part system. It's the building, it's the image, which contains the drawings and the photographs, and it's the articulated discourse. And discourse means the way we write and the way in which we speak. So definitely there are changes that are taking place and they affect the way in which we approach architecture, but we should remember that architecture has these other parts in this three-part system. Mm. Mm. I, what I also got from, I think, several of your papers is a kind of uh, plea, and maybe we already touched upon it a little bit, a plea for renewal in architectural re education. Um, I think I got it from, well, from several of you, and I was wondering if you could kind of summarize uh, what, what, yeah, what you think are the main um, points that need to be addressed there. Um, I, th I think especially, I think, uh, Sophia, in your uh, uh, talk, um, you address this issue. I think it would really help if um, uh, each of us that does architectural research in whichever mode, whichever perspective, whether we are dealing with it empirically or ethnographically or conceptually or historically or theoretically, uh, should sit together and explore our epistemological um, approaches, our paradigms, um, so that we can have a dialogue about where each of us is coming from and what are the assumptions that we are making when we are doing our architectural research. Because it's these assumptions that create these kinds of divides sometimes. Um, it's not that all schools have this divide, so I will just focus you know, uh, 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 on the Bartlett and based on my personal experience. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, there are strands of research which are more scientific, more empirical, more conceptual, more theoretical, and so on. I'm really interested in a dialogue between all these modes uh, mm -hmm. of doing research because uh, if we are just limiting ourselves on the theoretical or the conceptual mode, I think we're really missing um, uh, what uh, Wilfred said yesterday, that the building is the fact, is the facts, or what Kul has said, that uh, New York is a mountain range of evidence. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the idea of actually getting out there, visiting a building and understanding it by being there and then by analyzing the drawings, etc., etc. If on the other side we limit ourselves into this empirical method or the new um, uh, fashion or, I don't know, the spread of the data, the digital data, this really pushes us into practical modes of doing things uh, which are rushing ahead before, before it gives us enough time for reflection. And that worries me, worries me a lot. Uh, give people, who said that? Was it uh, um, back in Mr. Fuller? I said, give, don't teach people. He said, give people a tool and it changes the thinking. So these are tools that we now have. They change our thinking, and we really need to understand the changes that they bring to our thinking. Thank you. Uh, Birgitta, you want, to, you want to respond to that? No, I think that's uh, very much what, what I think as well, that the, the idea of reflection and critical thinking, I think that's also what you uh, mentioned, Yosa, like, like to, to ask yourself, what is it actually we're doing? And that's what I mean with that I'm not only interested in the building, of course, the building is essential and primary in the discipline to, to construct for those who, who do that. But basically, I'm also interested in, in this idea of, of the architect as participating in a society and, and looking at uh, what kind of role you can play. And of course you can create an object, but you can also take part in the decision-making process. So you can, it depends on how you look at it and how you analyze it from, the, from what viewpoint. Mm -hmm. And it is this criticality that uh, I encourage. Mm -hmm. and, and of course in the design discipline, I mean, there are different positions and I don't see a problem in that, that there are different positions for schools or whatever. Uh, I come from uh, an art ad academy myself in Copenhagen, and that's pretty, sh you know, obvious uh, what you deal with there. And I see Professor Tony, or <laughs> the emeritus Professor Tony Fretton sitting there, who, who never wanted to, <laughs> to kind of mention that that he was a school of thought, you know, and that the. Uh, that there are followers in, in specific traditions. But I do actually think that that's the way the design profession works. 
having said that, the, the, clause, the courses I teach are, is architecture analysis and architectural research, which is kind of, you know, next to these design classes. And what I try to facilitate is more kind of uh, help the students to understand their means while designing, you know, and how you can, how they're different means in relation to how you look at, at the architecture and, and how you define it through the different knowledge fields and lenses that I described. But of course, I'm, I'm also really open towards the other ways to look at this. Um, but I think that's basically what I think needs to be done, actually, is, is to not only design or not only educate architects that they are good designers within a specific tradition, uh, but that they're also able to become aware in a critical sense of in what way they contribute and that they are able to actually also make it accessible for other people what it is that they're doing, you know? And, and I think that's also why you also talk about knowledge field, Sophia, and that's basically what I think we need to do as architects instead mm -hmm. of just saying architecture is a creative discipline. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. But there's also a lot of knowledge in our discipline and it's, it's a barrier, you know, for a lot of people to actually access what it is if we can't talk about it, you know? So it's kind of, we, we, we build this myth around ourselves, which makes it impossible for a lot of people to actually, uh, yeah, you can say, uh, give, us the, give them the possibility to understand that there is knowledge out there and that's why you should invite architects into the decision process because they are the carriers of this uh, meaning, even though it might be tacit and whatever, that's another discussion. But maybe Tony, you want to say something. <laughs> why should we do? I'll try. Um, they're all fascinating presentations. I, I mean, I was thinking of what I might say, and then I won't necessarily be able to connect this, but I, I take very much what Joseph said about um, the effect of uh, new media on us. And having read some of that literature that you <clears throat> put up, it's, in a way, it's as insidious as realizing that you are probably breathing in or eating um, plastic particles without knowing it. Um, <laughs> I mean, the only, these are very disjointed statements. The only thing I'd say is that, that some of those people, Joseph, that you put forward might be architects who are attempting to establish a presence without having built very much, uh, which is a classic condition of young architects. Um, and it would be interesting, to, it will be interesting to see how they would be when they have to deal with the exigencies of making a project. But that didn't stop OMA from starting with propositions and ending up making buildings which to my mind are very curious and not really adding to our human experience. I mean, Birgitta's point, well, I, I know it because we discussed it a lot, um, is tremendously valid because I, I said yesterday that one lacking, one thing lacking is, is some kind of um, persuasive narrative to address issues of these times and that it isn't issue this i mean it's extremely issue issueful in terms of global warming and the effect on buildings and also the effect of um uh, displacement of people and things like that and sea rise so there's a, a powerful narrative which which could inform uh, the public doesn't have that narrative it has parts of it and that would be something which would give a, a focus of um architectural activity it doesn't it wouldn't deny the culture of architecture which is as important as anything in fact you know, any utilitarian change needs a cultural um, um, dimension to it to make it tolerable um, <laughs> I've run out of things to say <laughs> um, brr. Can, I, I, can I maybe yeah. Can I maybe ask something because um I, I ran is gonna throw a lifeboat. Thank I, you. Sorry. As always. Sorry. As always. <laughs> no, 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 because I I uh I think the idea of this contemporary practice as you were you, you were pointing at OMA, I think that's quite interesting because I mean these these offices they 
they announce themselves in the world through these media, which I, I personally also, I find uh, students looking a lot at uh, Instagram, of course, uh, taking these things in out of context and apparently don't have a lot of problem with that. And um, I completely see the fact that it, it is, um, can be quite destructive, but since you, you studied them quite extensively, do you think there are also benefits to be gained? Because what I see as a potential benefit maybe, although I'm not really heavily opinionated, is that um, people communicate with each other um, around the world. So this is new generation that has very different uh, ideas of, of, of taking ideas from other practices and, and uh, building onto them in a different way than, than maybe our generation uh, does. But so what do you think? Is it, is it, all, is it all bad? <laughs> is that a question to me? Yes, it is. Because um, <laughs> uh, you've been so of course, silent. <laughs> of course there are benefits. Um, I mean, that's why I think we're all attracted to these media. Uh, I mean, uh, we, I have an Instagram account, many people do, uh, while simultaneously being critical. Does that make us hypocritical? I, th I think there are benefits and there are uh, problems. And I, I, I think the difficulty is just how we, how we pass them and how we develop practices and a discourse around them and reflect on them and talk about them. I mean, yes, it puts us in, you know, it, it enables you to have many more acquaintances and that can seem positive, um, but it can also, mean that you don't really focus on the few acquaintances and the strong connections and strong friendships. Um, you know, there are, there are some instances in architectural history uh, where friendship is really important and it's a kind of silent history, but there are some architects that have been on the phone every night to very close friends talking about everything. And, um, you know, does that kind of practice happen in new generations reared on a social media where they consider their friends to be in the thousands, you know. Um, so there are, there are those kinds of concerns. And um, the, the yes, it, it makes us more knowledgeable about everything that's going on in the world, um, possibly to a crippling degree, uh, you know, hyper awareness that makes you feel like nothing you could do is new and produces a kind of deflated sense among young designers. Um, yeah, I would just say there are benefits and there are problems and we just have to navigate through them. Joseph, could I, could I jump in here for a minute? Because I rather was intrigued that you were taking on these kind of four firms through their Insta accounts, but you also did that very suggestive comment on the kind of collaborative and collective project that is architecture. And in a way, I mean, I'm completely on the fence here. Like I, I, I love reading Lanier, I love watching uh, memes go around the internet, so it's it's very, but I'm kind of intrigued now that you put up the f concern, that's a real concern about the kind of limitation of having thousands of friends, but no real friends. At the same time, one might suggest that these networks and these kind of slippages and connections and accidental momentary uh, connections also create that collective that you're also pointing to. And if I've noticed one thing in the kind of uh, networks that go around on these memes and, and builders like in Minecraft, is that there are things that kind of start to float to the surface, that there are a few that are followed more than others, that a Bureau Spectacular might drift up in a variety of media. And so I'm kind of curious how you think about that, about this kind of ambivalence um, and where you think it might be heading. Um, well, it's, it's just, I guess I give a similar answer. I think it's, it's certainly positive um, that there are kind of abilities of the larger network to, like you say, allow good ideas to percolate and they will propagate because they're good ideas, we could say, potentially. We could have that hope there's a kind of meritocracy to the um, vast cacophony. Um, but I would just say that um, you, there are just some questions about what kind of limitations of, so, of discourse are required for good conversation to take place. I think it's actually just quite a pragmatic concern 
Like um, it's the difference between spending uh, 30 hours writing one text versus, you know, um, a minute writing 30,000 texts or something. It's just a, a very pragmatic go, thing. Yeah, but does this then go to that idea that, because uh, both uh, Sophia and Brigitte are putting forward this idea of definition. So it's like a longer term grappling with ideas. Have you found anything similar to that in the more fluid and ephemeral networks? Um, you know, to, uh, so to what degree is there a wisdom of the crowd in a way? Like or, the, or, the, the value. or, or something that, you... that iterates many times, because I think that's one of the yeah. qualities that, that both Sophia and, and Brigitte are, are pointing to, that even in these very anonymous moments or, or in a kind of understanding of epistemologies of architecture, that there are, there are things that iterate again and again, and we have many layers of historical examples. So are there evidences of that that you can begin to see? I mean, I understand you're working with media that are very short, so it's not the same kind of issue as what Brigitte, for example, in buildings can really go through. But I, I'll give you one example that maybe answers your question. I mean, the post-digital, you know, the, the, the longer term trend over a course of two or three decades of, um, you know, grappling with the, the legacy of a postmodern phase of architectural discourse and its critique and demise during a so-called post-critical phase um, of kind of return to modernism, return to technique. And now we're seeing uh, amongst a, a whole generation, a whole in a whole, um, you know, there's a whole kind of geist in a way amongst a, a generation. I think something like that is, is a shared conversation. Um, Atelier Fowler won't explicitly talk about the pastel tones in their work, and they share it equally with many architects that also don't talk about it. But there's a kind of messaging in the choice of pastel colors, uh, which says something about uh, our views about modernism, uh, function and and the emphasis on architecture as a kind of cultural practice that's just embodied in the choice of pastel colors right now mm -hmm. and that's a kind of background shared phenomena that people aren't explicitly talking about so to some degree uh, yeah certain kinds of discursive paradigms operate within the crowd okay. but the, the problem is no one's talking about what their particular view on post criticality is or or the post digital i mean a few people but when you ask this generation, and I've been doing this a little bit through um, through my audio channel, doing interviews with people, um, you know, you ask them a simple question: Do you do you hope to write uh, complexity and contradiction for your generation? And you get very kind of ironic um, answer: You know, no. For, and why would I? And I don't. You know, I have no aspiration to encapsulate in a clear book something like the state of play in my field and my role within it. So it's a different kind of knowledge. There's a kind of tacit knowledge of uh, paradigmatic change that's going on around them, but no desire to make that knowledge explicit in the form that I think is required with basically text and, and books <laughs> so, Thank you. And, and lectures and what have you. May I jump into that, Joseph, because I really love the way that you're systematizing things and uh, dissecting actually these new media forms, which is definitely absolutely necessary because it's very fashionable as well. Um, but somehow, I, if, if I would compare it to the past, I wouldn't compare it like to the complete architectural discourse or the complete architectural culture. I would more compare it to the image, for example, of the fountainhead who's pointing at his uh, architectural model, you know, <laughs> creating an image. It's, it's about creating an identity and creating an image. And I think that's part of every decade and every time. Um, and um, there's always the masses. And I think that's, um, that's part of our mass communication now that all of these images, these fountainhead images that we are creating now, um, or let's say that they're creating now, of course I have an Instagram account as well, you know, <laughs> but that, uh, that they're creating on Instagram, it's, um, it's like, you know, the fountainhead image, how do you want to be perceived? Um, and it's not only the one within the time that sees that, it's the thousands and the millions that see that, and it's it's consumed. Um, and it, it's, it will always be like that. 
not everybody will try and, and reflect or be reflective or, or be discursive. Not everybody will do that. But the few who do, even on Instagram, I think, um, yes, images are shared. Uh, and then it's definitely not only about images or discussing pastel colors, but um, trying to take a position and just writing a small text on that position, you post it and then there's a discussion going on. And then, yeah, hopefully thousands of people can follow that immediately and instantly. And that's the idea of this Instagram thing. So I think there's so much more layers going on. Even Huge Campbell uh, in the questions, even there's it a bit more. And he says, um, Instagram can be used in a variety of reflective, experimental and critical ways as it is by some at this conference and can also serve to document progress on site, etc. The serving research in various forms. Yeah? It's very visual and it's very yeah, communicative. I think there's so many different layers to this media, which, which I think are very uh, interesting to, to look at, which, which go beyond this idea of uh, creation of our identity, no? So you have a lot of work to do there, yeah. <laughs> What I was thinking is, from my perspective, it's not necessarily a problem, the circulation of images. If you look at it historically, there's always been circulation of images. I mean, if, if you look at practices, I mean, I looked at a practice and, uh, who, who designed a hospital in the 1960s, 70s, and they were really honest about looking at, for example, Arne Jacobsen uh, in, in the, for example, the choice of certain materials and constructions and stuff like that. I mean, it's a part of the culture is, and, and, the, and the whole definition of the discipline is this internal codes and positioning within the discipline that we belong to different families, we know each other, we refer to each other. So I see more, maybe that's also what you mean, Joseph. The problem is not so much that it happens, but that it's not being discussed or surfaced in, in uh, in a critical way of it. I once went to a lecture not so long ago in Rotterdam in the garage where they invite these uh, famous architects and this was a French firm. And this guy, he only showed his Instagram photos. Uh, his lecture was a compilation of the Instagram photos. And while he was talking, I saw other architects taking up their mobile phone, you know, checking whether he showed the same images that they had on their phone. And in a way, he didn't say anything more than this is an image of, you know, this, or this is the plan drawing. He just said what you saw. And I was kind of, well, I could have stayed at home and just looked at his Instagram profile. I think that's the problem. The problem is not so much the circulation of images, but it's the devaluation of a discipline to become only the circulation of images. And then you also say in the service of, of economy and, uh, and whatever, you know, I think we always circulated images. What we need to do is to start analyzing them and addressing them. Why is this image important, for example, in relation to what it represents, what kind of, uh, what, what kind of meaning it carries? Why is pink or purple or green or, flashy or this or that important what is it what kind of value is it what kind of society do we, do we live in that we position ourselves like that as architect that we that we claim the word that we take back language like uh adrian forty is that architecture is not only a discipline which has to do with imagery it's also about language it's also about building it's all about building models it's about a lot of things and so we should use these other means and medias when we communicate and not uh, that that's for me the way i see it it's it's um one student of mine has looked at instagram images of three public spaces in london uh just focusing uh during the pandemic uh, uh, on what people really photograph in relation to these images and uh, trying to see whether there can be a definition of place based on the ways in which people share images and what is common in these images. What do they focus on? Which particular part of the space? The spaces with the British Library, Granary Square, mm -hmm. and the UCL Quad. Uh, so there can be many, many different ways by which we can really study this phenomenon, and many different ways by which we can understand the impact it makes on our bodily experience of place and of space, uh, or the kind of networks that develop through images, share, image sharing, uh, hashtagging. Um, there, are, there is an incredible depth behind this particular phenomenon and should not just stay, I think, on the level of the image alone, 
uh, or on the message of the yeah, image. Yeah, yeah. We should try to excavate it and really understand yeah. what it facilitates, how it really impacts uh, the other three, two definitions of architecture, which is the building or the physical space and the ways in which we talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I also think in, in, a, in a global uh, sense, I mean, there's a need to, to address this, I mean, this whole issue of circulating images all, of, all over the globe and like, uh, oh, we should become one community where there are, you know, maybe different interpretations. I just had a class with a lot of students from all over the world and I, I sincerely see a need for students coming from different parts of the world to kind of uh, get to know their own you know, way of belonging. Uh, like, like I had an African student who was definitely concerned about other issues than, for example, some of my French students. You know, so it's, it's the the problem is, um, and I think that's that's the interesting part about narrative. You know, what is it that that image is about, and how does that carry a story about uh, culture or belonging to a certain place or uh, stuff like that through means of association. Uh, so I think that's where we need language. <laughs> oh, for, uh, but some, I also had sometimes students that were not capable of using language. So they started to make these associative visual schemes to kind of, to, to build back and in, in rooting themselves in, in some kind of associative system. But basically I see in, in, a, in a global community uh, or global village, whatever we call it, I do see a need for students in this century, actually, to, to uh, identify themselves with where they come from and not like only this Eurocentric or uh, we all want to make architecture that looks the same way. I don't mm -hmm. see that. I see many different positions like that. I'm and going that's to maybe where Instagram is difficult. I'm going to pick in here because um, I have the feeling we could go on with this discussion for uh, another hour and we are limited in time because we have one more session to go. Um, so I want to conclude actually with thanking you, um, the three of you for a very rich um, contribution to this session. And um, I'm 